fact it's very very overrated Hello everyone and welcome to Strike Rate, the cricket analytics podcast with me, Jack Hope and Dan Weston. On this episode, we will be talking about failure. We're going to be looking back at the T20 World Cup a couple of days post India's heroic performance against the South African side in the final and thinking about the 19 teams that didn't lift the trophy. What went wrong for them? Why did they fail? And can we learn anything from it? Um, Dan, first of all, how are you doing? It's been a couple of weeks. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Getting prepared for the uh, upcoming 100 now. Um, so, yeah, very much looking forward to that. And uh, it's going to be a busy few weeks, I think. I um, started off in London for a week and then uh, around the country. Decent. Yeah, well, I'm sure we'll, we'll check in as we go through the tournament and have a, have a couple of conversation topics that hopefully come come out of that. Um, before we get going, just a message to everybody listening or watching. Make sure you click that subscribe button or follow if you're over on Apple or iTunes. And why not leave us a re- review as well? That helps us out in terms of chart rankings and things like that. So if you've been enjoying the podcast, uh, get involved like that. Uh, if it's your first episode as well, um, the the general idea is that most of these conversations are fairly evergreen. So have a look at the back catalogue. There's you know, a, a decent number of episodes now. And um you know, if you if you revisit some of those, I'm sure there'll be there'll be topics to your liking. Uh, Dan, before we get going, I, you know, in this episode we've got a lot to talk about. There's like I say, 19 teams that failed. We'll, we'll be mainly focusing here on the teams that I think had ambition to actually win the tournament or at least compete in the the knockout stages. Before we get to any of that, though. You know, in these competitions, like I said right at the beginning, 19 of the 20 teams, they, they, they're going to fail. What happens from an analytical point of view when a team you're working for fails? Because that's the expectation in, in, in most situations. You know, the IPL, nine out of 10 teams there, they're not going to win the trophy. It's, mm. um, it's more likely than not, you know, even if you're India in this T20 World Cup, it was more likely than not at the beginning of the tournament that they wouldn't lift the trophy. So... So, so what are the outcomes? What sort of things do you talk about? How do you, how do you analyse that? Yeah, I think that actually there's a really good example of unrealistic expectations for a lot of fans and a lot of international boards, owners, whatever. I think that realistically, all you can really do is get to the knockout stages to be successful, to be considered a success in the tournament. In the IPL, for example, that's coming in the top four out of the 10 teams. In in the T20 World Cup, that's also going into the last four. Obviously, there's 20 teams, but I think realistically, what did you say, 10 to 12 would be a major shock if they got anywhere near though, the, the knockout stages. So really, it's 8 to 10 that are fighting for those, those four spots. So again, similar sort of ratio to the IPL, if we're being realistic. Um and then from there, as, as, as you said, Jack, it's it's not a given that the best team will win the tournament. India, before the tournament, are not going to be have an over 50% chance of, of winning the, the World Cup. They are going to probably have to play in the knockout stages two matches, which are broadly 60-40 or something like that, to, to qualify. Um, and that's assuming that they get to the knockout stages. So... That if if you two two matches sixty forty, obviously your your favourite, decent favourite, but it's only thirty six percent likely to win both those two games. So that's there's a lot of variance involved. Five moments, and I think we saw that in the final as well, where where obviously the Siakuma Yadav catch could have changed a lot. South Africa could have approached their the chase a little bit dif- differently. There was a lot of different things that could have happened, small margins that would have caused a different result on the day. And I think that it's it's easy for the media and sometimes the supporters to to come up with narratives as to to why things happen. But I think a lot of the time it's just two really good teams playing each other, and matches decided in, in some, by some fine margins, really. Yeah. Um, so you know, from speaking about it from your your personal experience, um, I don't I don't want to bring it up, but not every team that you've you've um, you've been an analyst for has won the competition. Mm-hmm. Well, when, absolutely. When things come to an end, is it like a case of just pack your bags and see you later, or or is there like an analytical debrief that that happens? Um, I think it depends who who you're involved with, really, who you're working with. 
And like, I'll give you, I'll give you an anecdotal example. So, first season of a hundred, um, we at Birmingham Phoenix, we say we, uh, we, we got to the final. We won the group, so we got direct entry to to the final, and we ended up losing the final. Um, there was reasons why I think that that was the case, um, which could have maybe put the odds slightly more in our favour. Some decisions, decisions and stuff that. That were made, but ultimately, we played we play against Southern Brave. They're a very good team as well, and even I, I mean, like looking at looking at it, probably we won the group. You might say we're fifty five, forty five, sixty forty, maybe a push to win that to, to win that final, um, and that didn't happen. But I think there's a lot of a lot of scope to overthink things in that situation, and to, to look at the the small different things that that went wrong on the day, rather than actually realizing that the there might not be a lot that you could have done that, that would have changed the outcome. And and two good teams in the final, one of them's going to have to win it. And 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 unfortunately, on that day, it wasn't us. Um, I think I think it all depends as well on who who the people are running the teams. Different different owners or general managers or directors of cricket will want different things from from me. Um, some will will be pretty intense. Some will be pretty laid back. And that's also you could say the same thing for captains as well. I, I've been in situations where where uh, one of my teams has gone on a bit of a losing run, and actually I'm at this point the one who's trying to kind of show the we we the, the, we don't need to push the panic button basically you know like the five five losses in a row for example you might you might be able to prove to them using the analytics that actually we could have le- we just realistically won three of those and you know a bad 15 20 percent of a game cost cost the team and then the underlying metrics were 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 pretty good and don't push the panic button. Don't make any changes, and and that's as important, I think, as as reacting to wins is how you react to losses. We've seen in the IPL so many times that, that struggling teams just like make three, four changes on a regular basis, whereas the more successful historical teams tend to have a kind of very settled core. And 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 I think that that's important as well. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Dan, let's get to some of the teams in, in this tournament. And I think we'll start with the, the biggest failures and then maybe make our way through to some of the teams that went a little bit further in the tournament but ultimately didn't win. Pakistan have to be top of the list in terms of spectacularly blowing uh, their opportunity to make it through to the Super 8s. They obviously lost to the USA. They had, um, a, you know, maybe not a close game with uh canada but certainly not an absolute battering and they did have a close game with ireland and obviously lost um to india as well broad brush what did pakistan do wrong at this t20 world cup well i think the original plan was to to do an entire podcast on 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 reasons for failure of Pakistan, and I still think we would definitely be able to get get enough content to be able to do that. But 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 broadly speaking, I think that there's a few issues. One is that I don't think that Baba and Rizwan can play in the same team um, because they're both of them are too too put too much pressure on the opposition. So on their their teammates, I should say, to to score quickly because they've chewed up too many balls at the top of the order. Um, and I definitely don't think that, that, that they can exploit the power play as much as they, they, they can or should do in, in in the vast majority of matches. Secondly, I didn't like the fact that, that they brought in two players who had previously retired from international cricket. I don't, I don't see that that's going to be great for team harmony, especially when there's discussion about yeah, those kind of those players being quite vociferous in criticism among some of the current other players on TV, for example. I think that from what everyone tells me, not just in terms of PSL, but also in terms of the Pakistan national team, a lot of people make, make the point that actually the kind of the players run the show, that the coaches are actually almost like a, a secondary part of of the, the the fabric of the Pakistan national team. And 
and uh, a coach is probably more likely to get sacked than certain players will be to get dropped. And I think that that's a very, very difficult situation for for a coach to be in and, and, and cannot be any, it can, cannot contribute to anything like a successful environment in that situation where you, you, you as a coach, you're, you're scared of certain players or you're scared of putting noses out of joint. That's just not going to be acceptable. Uh, and I think as well, uh, one of the other the other issues is the, the downturn in um, performances from Shadab Khan with the ball as well. So um, several years ago, I mean, he was he was an exceptional rounder, but without him, Pakistan's spinners hat looks really quite insipid. And uh, the sooner he gets his bowling mojo back, the better for Pakistan. Yeah, if you want a, an idea of Shadab Khan's well diminishing relevance i suppose as a t20 bowler his economy in 2022 was 6.8 in international cricket then 7.5 in 2023 uh 9.6 this year uh averages over those same three years 20 32 and 73 so he's going for more runs taking fewer wickets um that that is a problem now one of the things i, I was going to ask here and i was doing some research into this from a from a pakistan point of view like if we if we kind of accept that Babar and Rizwan as a as a combination is no longer viable if they want to compete against the the best teams, where can they go? Because they're the the shelf isn't you know jam packed full of other guys. Like I'm a big fan of Mohammed Harris, but then after that I was I was kind of looking through the the options that they've got, and I, and I thought they were looking a bit thin. Well, you've got you got the problem is as well is you've got. So you've got Mohamed Harris, who, who's not playing. You've got Sinai Yip, who's in and out. You've also got uh, Fakhar Zaman at, at, at three, who's an opener, but generally speaking. Uh, and uh, I've kind of lost, lost my train of thought about who, who bats four for them, but I'm pretty sure that, that they, they often bat higher up the order as well. Um, we just... It's a rotating cast. Uh, man can't. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, like you've got, I've got like four, three or four openers in the same team. So actually, when you look at it like that, there's six, there's six openers competing for two spots. So actually, if you do lose a, I think you'd more like to lose a Rizwan than you would a Babar. Um, there's enough options there. The biggest problem is as well is that you've got those sort of square pegs in in round holes in the middle order. When you've got Shadab Khan at five, you've got in some games they played Imad Wazim at batted Imad Wazim at five as well. And, and if Imad Wazim is a number five, then then I don't know what I am because like it's it's, it's absolutely incredible really to think that that someone yeah uh, sort of a lower lower order depth extra depth batter I would probably call Imad Wazim is not a number five at international level. You've got as Am Khan, who, who's constantly coming in, in in situations where he has to go from ball one. We've spoke about As Am Khan before in, in that situation where he actually does well against good bowlers, who was in one of our previous pods. And then you've got Ifta Karaman, who's very, very pigeonholed as a pace finisher, pace hitting finisher, rather than a middle order, middle order player. So they've got a massive problem in the middle order. Um, that would be my my focus. So so almost just just it's a bit like England England in football at the moment. We're playing Kieran Tripp here at, at left back and um, Foden on the left left of midfield. Is that you? They're just picking the players who they want to pick as opposed to the players who are best suited for that particular role in the team. Basically, yeah. Um, another thing with Pakistan. Like, you know, over the last five years, the, the argument that I think Pakistan would make about their play style is that they've got an, an elite bowling attack. Mm -hmm. And therefore, elite if they can... Bowling attack. Yeah, if they can, if they can regularly get to 160, then they're going to be in a lot of matches because they'll take wickets and yep. they're, they're, they're a handful. Is that Does that theory still hold for, for this team? Or, or have they moved out of the cycle at which Shaheen and Harris Ralph were genuine elite players? Um, I'm not sure Harris Ralph was ever a genuine elite player. I'm not going to say genuine elite player. I'm not top five bowler in the world, like, alongside, you know, likes of Bumrah, for example. 
Um, but he was obviously very good. Um, Sahin is a bit like it's, it's strange really because as his batting and his hitting has improved, his bowling seems to have dropped off a little bit. He's still a good bowler, don't get me wrong, but is he the bowler that he was two or three years ago? I don't think he. I don't think he is. Uh, and so the, 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 that was the Pakistan model when they had a lot of success and they, they were, I think, number one ranked in the world in, in T20 internationals. They they did um, have that mentality where they could just post 160 and defend it or, 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 or limit the opposition to a small total if they batted first and then chase, chase it with kind of anchor players. Um, but... The sport evolves. The T twenty as a format is is continually dialed up as the boundary percentages and strike rates for for each teams each league is generally on an upward trend. Have Pakistan um, evolved with that? I would say probably not. And unfortunately, that's come at a time when Shahin Shahafridi and, and Shadab Khan, with the, both with the ball, have dropped off a little bit, and and, and these things kind of create this perfect storm where where it's not going very well for them at the moment at all. Yeah. A um, couple more points then, just to wrap up on Pakistan. Obviously, they're, they're a team that lose to, uh, well, a genuine cricket, cricket cricketing minnow in, in the USA. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's an element of this. Maybe not that surprising. And maybe the, the teams that we think of as cricketing minnows, they're actually a bit closer to the, the good teams. Than we think, or or was this a genuine aberration? Oh, no, I, I don't think that Pakistan and USA can be compared in terms of ability at all. Um, and and actually, as the tournament went on, you really did see the difference between some of the minnows and some of the major teams. And actually, if you and I've done this, if you look at players' numbers against better teams, and you could even say that for say England players against India, Australia, etc. There's a big drop off. Um, the thing that, that created, I think, this this shock against the USA was that Pakistan are a very very high variance team, as well as, as as all the other problems. They're very very high variance, so their their peak can beat anybody. They have a very high ceiling, but they also have a very low worst level, and and, and we saw that I think in evidence in the, in in that game against uh, USA in the group stages. So so whereas like India, Australia, England, probably even South Africa, um, you would say, you know, like they're not going to lose to the USA like 99 times out of 100. Whereas Pakistan might beat USA by a bigger margin sometimes, but they would also lose more often as well to them, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Uh, final thing then for, for Pakistan specifically, just to wrap up part one. They have an India problem. India are getting better. India are already pretty good, and India are getting better. They've got a setup that works. They've got a league that produces great players, and they're always drawn in Pakistan's group. And I, and I think, you know, I, I say drawn. I think we can assume that they will continue to be drawn in allotted. Pakistan's <laughs> allotted, yeah, to to Pakistan's group for for ICC tournaments in, in the future. Um. That appears to me like a a specific problem for for Pakistan, and and is there anything that they can do about that? Like, can they become specialist specialists against India or something like that to to give themselves a better chance in these tournaments in future? Um, well, I think first of all, like, I don't think you can. You, this was a major issue for them failing. I mean, ultimately, we know that the major issue for them failing was they lost to the USA. Uh, like, you know, a five team group of India, Pakistan, USA, Canada, and Ireland should be India and Pakistan qualifying pretty much always from, from that group. So you beat the three minnows uh, uh, and and life is good basically that's that's that would be the game plan going in it doesn't really matter if you win or lose against india especially when you're not carrying over points into the uh, to the next stage um obviously the other third thing is is that pakistan what they can do is that they have scope to play more t20 matches in terms of their players getting more exposure to different conditions in different countries than, than India's players can, because obviously Indian players aren't allowed to play overseas franchise leagues uh, and are playing the T20 league in the IPL. 
which obviously Pakistan can't play, which is another issue in itself. However, the Pakistan players can play in every other league in the world, except their board has decided that in their infinite wisdom, they can only play two leagues. So, and they're really strict on that. So, for example, Usama Mir, who, who wasn't even in the squad for this tournament, was withdrawn from his T20 Blast contract at Worcester on the grounds that he'd already maximised his leagues that he pl could play by being the 100 last year and, and the Big Bash over the winter. So he'd already maximised the league, so they pulled him out of the, the deal with Worcester, despite the fact that he wasn't even in the World Cup squad. I mean, the, the, I mean don't even get me started on stuff like that. And when, and when you also consider that the fact that his Big Bash uh, stint got cut short because Pakistan recalled him for international <laughs> cricket. So, I mean, like, poor guy. I mean, like, uh, uh, you, you look at you look at examples of teams shooting themselves in their foot, and, and and I think you've got a great one there straight away. So, what Pakistan can do, obviously, is to kind of relax those kind of very, very strange um, restrictions on their players and get them as much experience as they can in worldwide conditions. Now, Pakistan actually played, they've got, their squad have more appearances in the CPL than any other team apart from the West Indies in this World Cup. But they didn't actually earn the right to get to the West Indies to play there. So, but what I'm trying to say is that actually, they probably would have been pretty good if they'd have got to the West Indies because they're very, very experienced in those conditions. India don't have that. They can't do that. So actually, that's maybe where Pakistan the board and the management have to get together and say, what what are these, what are what is the way that we can get an advantage over not just India, of course India is important to beat as well, but the, the overall global T20 landscape basically. Yeah, uh, Dan, uh, that's they're all my discussion points. We did have a couple of questions from Cricket on your screen, uh, who asked why has data fundamentally been unused constructively by Pakistan despite them having data guys around the team? Can you answer that? Well, obviously, I'm not privy to their individual decision making, but look, I think that you've got an environment where who you are and who your allies are, are probably, is probably more important than the numbers that you're you're putting out on the pitch. Uh, and until that changes, then that's another major hurdle that Pakistan have got to overcome to succeed in international tournaments. Fair. Um, the second question was actually on um, the the limiting by the PCB of players to two leagues. So mm -hmm. you've addressed that already. What we'll do is take a quick break. Uh, then we shall come back and we will talk. We'll talk New Zealand and a little bit of Sri Lanka, who are two of the other nations that bombed out of the tournament in the group stage. Track it's very, very overrated. Welcome back, everyone, to Strike Rate, the Cricket Analytics podcast. We're talking failure, the teams that failed at the T20 World Cup. Um, Dan, we're going to move on to New Zealand. Probably the other team would have expected to get through the Super 8s. Uh, a tougher group, I think it's fair to say, than Pakistan, mm. Afghanistan, not, not mugs. And Af Afghanistan, you know, they've had their greatest tournament ever and proved that they're not mugs by turning over Australia as well. However, New Zealand, generally speaking, you would you would back them to beat Afghanistan and get through the group. In the event, they were demolished, um, and that meant that it was going to be very difficult for them to get through. Ended pretty badly for New Zealand and, and their kind of golden generation, if you will. Where do we start with them? Um, I think there's a lot of factors involved in this. First of all, I don't think that New Zealand losing to Afghanistan in a major T20 tournament is a shock anymore. Um, Afghanistan, the four frontline bowlers that Afghanistan played in that game, uh, two paces, Naveen and Fazal Hatfaruki, uh, the spinners, Noor, Ahmed and Rash Khan. I mean, like that's as good as any team in the comp, basically. I, I've got no doubt about that. And so... Losing to Afghanistan can happen. Afghanistan at the moment, I've said this before on some other pods recently as well, is that their Gerbars are bust. And he's actually, even though he's Rashid Khan is their, their in the best player, 
Gerbatas is a most important player because he's the only batter who can play the innings like he played against New Zealand. 80 or 56 balls with five sixes. Uh, he's the only one capable of doing that, really, in the Afghanistan team. So if he fires, they've got a chance of beating anybody. I think with New Zealand, I think there was a few problems. First of all, they didn't play their first game in the tournament until 7th of June, so they had quite a lot of waiting around to do before they started their campaign. Uh, the players came straight from the IPL, a lot of them, uh, and they also have, in my view anyway, ignored a lot of the things that I look, look at in terms of the age curve drop-off as players players decline with age. I, I think realistically, this, I mean, this was definitely one tournament too many for Kane Williamson, unfortunately for him. I think we've spoken a little bit about how bad his strike rates have been over the last couple of years in, in T20. Um, Devin Conway was just coming back from injury. He's he's older than a lot of people think as well. Um, I'm not sure Mark Chapman is, is good enough at the highest level. Uh, certainly not someone that would, would in my view, get in in an IPL contract. Finn Allen is, is high variance, very talented. Brace was coming back from a long-term injury, and they lost uh, Adam Milne who, who, with injury, so who, who I rate really highly with the ball. So they brought in Matt Henry instead and didn't play uh, Southie either. So you can see how there's this evolution from, as you say, like, you know, golden, golden generation of New Zealand players into this kind of mishmash of a squad that's in decline and young players are still a little bit unproven. And it's really quite reliant, I think. The big, the big name bowlers, Ferguson and Bolt, Santner to some degree, a lot of it's going to be on them as to whether they can restrict teams and then to a reasonable total. They're almost like how Pakistan were with that 160 kind of mentality that we spoke about earlier. Yeah, uh, Williamson specifically. Like a few people had a theory that Williamson might be quite useful in this tournament. Like the, there was an expectation that the scores would be quite low and that maybe his uh, lack of scoring intent wouldn't be such an issue and that he'd just score, he'd be, you know, he'd be able to score a volume of runs that, that was useful. Didn't quite work out like that. He's got, got scores of nine and one, the Afghanistan and West Indies. Didn't bat against Uganda and then 18 or 17 balls uh, not out against Papua New Guinea. So a pretty miserable tournament for him. Uh, he has said that he will move on. Well, not really. Not, not said. He said that he will reject the central contract from New Zealand coming up this year. He's maybe open to that in the future. Uh, and I think the expectation is, Dan, probably worryingly for wherever he ends up, that he will be playing in some domestic T20 leagues over the, the, the near future. So uh, I think if you're the fans of one of them, uh, com commiserations would be would be what I would say. Yeah. Uh, my, my viewpoint on this, and if we're just talking completely about on-pitch expected level performances, which I think uh, we have to do, the fact that anyone who thinks that analytics is taking over cricket and is and is saturating the the cricket world, all you need to do to as a counter argument is to point the fact point the fact that I think Kane Williamson's going to get an XA twenty contract. I think that's the contract that he's taken to turn down the central contract in his, for New Zealand. I mean, if I, I mean he's I, it's horrible to say, but I think he's done New Zealand a favour by rejecting this central contract and. Um, it shows, I think, a lot of, of what I say is true as well, is that these countries are, are so reluctant to get rid of legacy players. We don't see it so much in other sports. We definitely don't see it in club football. See it in international football maybe slightly more, but not that much. Um, nowhere near the same extent. And, and I mean, if... if Realistically speaking, he should be eternally grateful that, that New Zealand are offering him a contract now based on his on-pitch performance levels. Uh, and it's absolutely bizarre that a T20 team in a decent league still wants to recruit him. Yeah, it is It is kind of weird. Um, when we're looking at the next generation for New Zealand, is there is there any reason to be hopeful if you're a Kiwi? 
Definitely. Um, they've got some young players coming through for sure, or younger players, I should say. What one New Zealand I find that, that yeah, they do is they don't give players opportunities as uh, as quickly as some of the other countries. They they really do kind of stay very wedded to the core group that they've got uh, when it comes to when it comes to the big tournaments in particular. Now looking at New Zealand now. They've got to start integrating some new players. They've got, uh, I would say, Josh Clarkson probably should have should have been involved more. I've said that for a good year or two. Tim Robinson is highly rated as as, as a batter, um, and also two paces, Willow Rock and, and Zach Folks, who English fans might be interested to know, has just got a T20 blast deal at Warwickshire. Uh, and also the leg spinner Ashok as well has has potential, and I think can be the definitely the uh, the uh, successor to Tim South. Uh, to, to Ish Sodi, I should say. Sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, so sure. yeah, yeah. There's there, there's hope, but the key now is to integrate these guys into the squad. Maybe there's going to be some short term pain in bilateral series. Obviously, you've got Finn Allen as well, who's a younger player. Still got Glenn Phillips, who's who's going to be around peak age for a little while. Uh, 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 and Santa will co- keep going for at least another cycle as well. Um, so the, the, there's, there's hope, but they've got to get integrated as much as possible. You've got to give them game time in the bilaterals. You might have to sacrifice, I don't know, the Champions Trophy next year to then get some some joy in the World Cups in the, in the later on in this sort of four year cycle. Yeah, for uh, other, the other team, and we probably don't need to speak about them for as as long. So I don't think there was loads of expectation about this side going into the tournament, but they were maybe the darkest of dark horses to cause some upsets. Mm. Um, Sri Lanka, like good bowling, pretty abysmal batting is the is the too long didn't read for them. Yeah, anything <laughs> deeper than that that you would say about Sri Lanka? Well, I, I think it was entirely predictable, really, in terms of the dynamic of of their squad. They've got, as you say, a strong bowling lineup. They've got bowlers who will attract interest in IPL auctions, for example. But you've got an extremely pedestrian batting lineup, um, and. That was shown again in this tournament. I think that that's a structural issue, the same as it is for Bangladesh as well, although Bangladesh did come above Sri Lanka in, in that group, despite, in my opinion, being a worse team. Um, it's a structural issue, and, and it's, got to, it, 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 it's got, to, you know, got to use the Lanka League better. They've got to use domestic system better to find players who are, are different. You can't go on relying on the likes of Angelo Matthews, who must be about forty by now, to 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 bail you out of trouble. I think about five. I think five of their top six. I think I read had a strike rate of like one twenty or below in in a career. And you can't you can't pick players like that. It's as simple as that. I would have rather they'd gone for guys like Rajapaksa, who who's got high high intent, and high upside, rather than these kind of <laughs> array of anchors that they've picked, basically. Yeah, they're not even that good at anchoring. Are they? No, I mean, it's no. it's not like they were getting 140 for three. They were, <laughs> they were getting no. flat. I know they I know they played on some tricky decks, but um, not a not a great tournament. Uh, They've got a new coach. Oh, that that's a good thing for them. Um, Silverwood has has resigned uh, this week, so they've got the opportunity uh, to make a change and to 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 restructure and 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 hopefully. Come to the World Cup in, in a couple of years' time, they can make a big difference. Um, you you mentioned Rajapaksa, I think, who's a who's a player who's got a little bit of a cult following um, mm. as as a potential batting guy that could come in. Are, are there really many others in the in the Lanka League or or whatever that's called? Um, if that even goes ahead, like what? Well, start what you know, going ahead. Oh, well, they've actually. Is, is is go ahead? Great. Well, that's that's step one in the right direction, then, isn't it? Are there are there any players that you'd maybe say at some point over the next two to five years we we could see making some waves in international cricket? Uh, probably a couple. Um, but the, but again, then what batters? That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> All the good young players are bowlers. Um, I quite like Dulith Weller Weller Lake. I can't. I'm not sure. Weller Lager. 
Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Um, he bowls left arm orthodox uh, and bats left handed. Um, but he's more of an anchor again. That's 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 a very similar dynamic to what they've already got. But you can understand how, you know, in a, in a post Angelo Matthews world, he might be able to add balance to the to this to the team. Um, I like the op- opportunity that they've got to get another good spinner into their group. So they've got obviously Hasaranga and they've got um, Tichana. They've also now got the opportunity to get uh, VS Kanth into into their group, who's a lady who made his debut for SRH recently in the IPL. Uh, apart from that, I mean, I've got a list of players I keep an eye on um, for, from each country who are, who are young, and and there there are I've got eight Sri Lankans on there, and they all bowl. Yeah, I was just looking at the first game of the Lanka Premier League, uh, which, which, as you said, kicked off today. Mark Chapman, 91 of 61. He was a star for Dambula. And then for Candy, Angelo Matthews and Dasan Shanaka, probably the two the two top players. Stina Shanima got some few, a few runs as well. So it's not they're not necessarily new names or even Sri Lankans in the case of uh, Mark Chapman from, from the first game. So ho- hopefully somebody comes through uh, from a Sri Lankan perspective uh, at some point soon. Uh, Dan, we're going to take another quick break here. And then we're going to come back and talk about the teams that failed out in the Super 8 stage or beyond. Track is very, very overrated. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Strike Rate, the cricket analytics podcast with me, Jack Hope and Dan Weston. Um, If you want to get involved and ask us a question, we do regular shout outs for questions. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Jack Hope Zero and Dan is at SA Advantage. And if you're enjoying the podcast, do make sure you click like and follow and share it with a friend. Tell your mum, tell your dad, tell your dog. Get your dog uh, a set of dog headphones and play it to try create the Cricket Analytics podcast on repeat. Then your dog can become properly clued up. On... One of my dogs is a particular fan. He's been on it a couple of times, isn't he? Yeah. Frankly. Yeah. yeah. What a yeah. Um, Dan, there, there, are, there are probably three teams that went out in the Super 8 stage that might be a bit disappointed. We'll start with the one that will be most disappointed. That's Australia. They were in a group with India, Afghanistan and Bangladesh. They lost twice to India, which I think was somewhat predictable. And then to Afghanistan. Now, the, the Afghanistan game, like, like you were saying earlier, Afghanistan aren't in the proper mug territory. You know, they're not in the proper mug bucket when it comes to T- T20 cricket, but they're not also in the best two teams in the tournament bucket, which is what we were saying about Australia, putting them up with India, you know, less than, what, 10 days ago. A few weird things happened in that game, I thought. Um, and a few weird things maybe happened for Australia through the tournament. One I wanted to ask you about specifically was their decision to not play. Mitchell Stark in that game, despite knowing, as everyone in the whole world should have known, that Gerbaz was basically the key to the game. Like, surely in that situation, you you play your big strike bowler, knowing that it's a must-win game because you've got India in the last match, and try and get him out. Was 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 Ashton Agar the solution that they needed? I actually, I, I can get where they're coming from with it a little bit because. If you look at it from a matchup perspective, Agar against Gerbars could probably tie tie him down in terms of scoring rate. Uh, and Agar over Stark with the bat adds more depth as well in 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 a low scoring chase, which is actually, of course, what what did ensue was the, the a low scoring chase. I think I'm fine with that. I don't think that's in any way, shape, or form the reason why they lost the game. I think the reason why they lost the game was because no one scored more than 12 apart from Glenn Maxwell. Um, and obviously, Australia had a big warning from, from Afghanistan already in the 50 over World Cup where Maxwell had to score 200. I, honestly, the most outstanding innings I think I've seen for a long time, if ever. To, to prevent Afghanistan winning that match as well. So, look, it's not it's a shock, but it's not 
an absurd shock. It's not like USA beating Pakistan. I think that the, 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 there's different levels of that. Australia now, again, similar to New Zealand, similar to, to England as well, are going to have to to look at where they go from here. The likes of, of Warner, the likes of Wade, maybe one or two of the bowlers, maybe a Mitch Marsh. They might, even even a Stoinis now is getting, getting older as well. Stoinis is, Stoinis turns 35 in August next month. So, you know, like... How many of them are you going to want around for another four-year cycle of, of major tournaments? N not that many. So it's time perhaps now to get the Fraser McGurks in, the Nathan Ellis's, um, even maybe a Will Sutherland who could maybe play that that, that Marcus Stoinis role eventually. Um, and Josh Inglis for, for Matthew Wade. I mean, I was quite surprised they went with Wade over Inglis to start with. Um, overall, like, they... they They've got to make. They're going to have to integrate those new players into the group as well. So you're saying, from an Australian point of view, was it one tournament too many, or or was it a, a good team that tripped up? I think a bit of both. Um, I think a good team that lost to a capable opponent on the day. Again, Gabar's got sixty, and that was a big, big, a big uh, chunk of Afghanistan's hundred and forty-eight. Um, Gabar's that ended up as top run scorer for the whole tournament. Um, and then I think one one tournament too many for for a few of the veterans, particularly lots of Wade and Warner, probably as well. Uh, I think that that both things can be true at the same time. Fair enough. Um, anything else in Australia before we move on to West Indies? Uh, I don't think so. No, pretty cool with that. Fair enough. Uh, so West Indies are playing in a home tournament. Um, they've been a bit up and down. I think it's fair to say in, in cricket in general and maybe white ball cricket especially, over the last few years. They did try to make some sort of an effort to kind of like get the band back together a little bit for, for this tournament. We saw Dre Russ back in the side, for example. Um, but they, they just didn't have enough to beat either England or, or South Africa, which is what they would have needed to do to get through to the, the semi-finals. Did they finish about where you'd have expected them to finish, bearing that in mind? Or was this an opportunity missed in a home comp? Um, I I think broadly about right. Um, I think in that, that second group of the Super 8s, you've got South Africa and in, in, in West Indies, who who are all broadly in, in these kind of matchups in these conditions, probably between 40-60 and 60-40 against each other in, in, in a kind of like a th round-robin three-team group with all expected to be heavy favourites against the USA, who did indeed end up three losses from three in that Super 8 stage. Um, you know, a couple, couple of relatively close losses for the West Indies um, could have been quite different for them. I think they'll still be encouraged by this in terms of, you know, this not so long ago, this was a team that actually, I think, missed out on a major tournament through failure to qualify. So probably looking at this, they're be, they're, if you're looking at it in terms of ranking of the tournament, you're probably looking at them being sort of fifth or sixth overall. If there was, they probably have a fifth place playoff with Australia in in that kind of in that sense. And uh, I think that's progress. The problem the problem for them more lies in the fact that you've got the likes of Andre Russell, uh, who you can't count on going on forever. Yeah, I, I think that is a big problem for West Indies. They, I mean, obviously they had a massive golden generation, probably talking six plus years ago now, that, yeah. that you could say that they were at the, at the peak of their powers. And they've been sort of dropping off ever since. I was going back through the players from the CPL last year and the year before, and I couldn't really see that much in the way of sort of young, young talent. There's a few guys in their kind of mid to late 20s doing stuff mm. but the, I, I couldn't see anyone who was sort of sub to under 25 who looked like they were breaking through it, it, it in a major way is is there anyone that you'd suggest the west indies maybe had a look at certainly not from like a hitter's perspective i, don't, I think that we're, we're really quite quite short on 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 that, although there's, there's a couple couple who are really unproven, but but perhaps born in sort of that 2005 2006 
range where they've, they've got to probably play a, lot, a bit of 18 cricket and a bit of franchise cricket before you would think about uh, having really high hopes for them. I would say that the, the a couple of the, the their bowlers I do like. I, I really like Jaden Seals. I think he's he could play all formats for them. He made a major impact at Sussex in English cricket this summer in Red Bull cricket, and I'd expect him actually to to break through uh, into the Test team against England this summer imminently. Uh, and and um, I've been excited and I like what I see from from Matthew Ford, who's a, a right arm pacer um, and bats a bit down the order as well. He, he's he's had a handful of international appearances so far and done well in the CPL as well. So there's a couple of a couple of bowling options there, but I'm not sure necessarily that that's that's their, their weakest area. The bowling is okay. It's probably their batting that's very inconsistent at the moment. Yeah, I wonder with their batting. Um, and you've seen this with a couple of their guys, uh, you know, to, to some extent anyway. I wonder whether they can kind of convert some of their anchor talent into players that do project better as as kind of hitters. Now, the, the guy I, I'm thinking of when I say that is probably Kyle Mayers, who mm. really wasn't anything, you know, anything approaching a hitter until 2023. And then suddenly in international cricket, he struck at 160 and upped his strike rate significantly in domestic cricket as well, from sort of 120 to 140. And it's in domestic cricket this year, he's striking at 153. So like there's there has been a transformation there and, and maybe you could say something similar for, for shy hope as well. And, and his strike rates over, over the years, they've generally trended up. I, I think what I'm wondering here kind of out loud is whether there's, there are circumstances unique to West Indies cricket that really incentivize batters later in their career to make that transition into a more hitter type role where you might not see them do that. In, in other nations where where there's potentially other opportunities to to make money playing first class cricket or or or, or you know in in other areas I don't know if that's anything you've ever thought Dan well I, I think for me like the the key the key development area for them straight away is to get these young get some young talent into the CPL the CPL is quite a pedestrian league a lot of the time and there's 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 not a huge amount of as you said earlier, like the you know players banging on the door to paraphrase what you said earlier in the West Indies team. What I want to see is the West Indies and CPL teams fast tracking guys to get over, uh, get get T uh, Twenty League exposure. Guys like Jordan Jordan Johnson, who who's a le- uh, left hander, um, who looks pretty good from from under nineteen tournaments and. Um, uh, West Indies kind of A A setups against Ireland recently, um, and the same for Jewel Andrew, who got 143 against Ireland last month, and looks a real talent, a, a right-hander who who can keep wicket as well, um, and a six-hitting machine. Uh, for example, uh, he's looking at about four or five percent sixes in 50 over cricket, for example. So that 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 should translate pretty well to T20. As a 17-year-old, I think that, that he could be a, a really huge talent, but he's got to play. and He's got to learn how to construct innings. He's got to learn how to fail. He's got to learn how to fail better the next time. And and, and it's no good for having these talents who are sort of 17, 18, 19, 20, and then waiting until they're 25 to get an opportunity. Can we get them? Can they get 50 games under their belt by the time they're 22? The Rian Parag route to, to success. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, Dan, there's a, there's a few more teams left to talk about. Um, Bangladesh, I, I would say, probably didn't fail uh, in terms of getting through to the next round. So I don't think we need to spend much or any time on them. Uh, Afghanistan, I think you'd probably judge their tournament as a success for getting through to the semi finals. Um, one team that maybe would have liked to go a step further is England, though. It's a question for you, Dan. Is is the semi finals a success for for England, or or did they come up short? Um, I think the semi final for England, the way that this tournament structured is like the minimum standard required. Um, getting through to the super eights is certainly minimum standard required. Did they ever really impress in the tournament? Maybe you could say 
probably the game against West Indies. Again, so when I'm talking about impressing, I'm talking about against decent opposition. The game against West Indies probably would be be the the one that you said they that they played their best in. Um, I actually think it was a really disappointing tournament though, for England. I think that a lot of the the issues that we could have foreseen, and I that I'm you know, I'm on record as saying both on podcasts and on social media, the the that were I I thought were apparent when England selected their squad, I think it has completely come true. And therefore, I think this is the minimum standard required based on their standing in the game, finances, and and the fact that they've still got some very, very good players, but they're not good enough to beat the best teams consistently at the moment. And we've seen that. I think they've only won three games against major teams in the last two, two World Cups. And that's a major issue. Yeah. Uh, Dan... Did South Africa fail? No, no, definitely not. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, Feels like it. <laughs> it does probably feel like it to a lot of their supporters, but I think ultimately we have to, to give them credit to getting in a position where they were huge favourites to beat India in the final. Uh, and, and they've got a squad, I think, that's, that's reasonably future-proofed as well. You can definitely see, see how that they might adapt this squad over the next cycle. For example, you might have a, a Rickleton in for Reza Hendricks, and uh, you could have a Donovan Ferreira coming in for Miller if he gets older and, and declines. So, just two several examples. You're going to be a Mulder in that that sort of six spot, adding a bit more balance as well. Um, the only thing that I'd say for for South Africa really is that they they've got quite a long tail. So when they do get under pressure, like they did against in doing the final, that's that's a big problem when the batting stops at kind of six, basically. Yeah, I thought, um, yeah, obviously that was a problem and Boomer bowled amazingly and that doesn't help. And even Hardik was bowling. Well, Hardik and Arshley both bowled pretty well as well. I, yeah. I did think there was a mindset problem. So talk about the minutiae of a game a little bit. When you need, what was it, 26 or 24 balls, you, you basically yeah. need to hit three boundaries and you you win the game and, and they just they just didn't try and hit any boundaries and it was um you know i i i i fully get it like it, against bumro it's it's hard to maybe get yourself into a, a a mindset where you're prepared to take that risk because you know your stumps might go everywhere but oh. squeeze one away and you win the game <laughs> it's well, six onwards miller Janssen, maharaj rabada nokia they they faced 32 balls and they hit three boundaries and, yeah. and Miller faced 17 of those balls. He's got to see them home in that situation. And I'll, yeah. I've seen Miller do this before. Like, he goes into a shell a little bit in these kind of chases. Uh, anyone who's interested, good scorecards look up, for example, to illustrate my point. Welsh fire against Birmingham Phoenix in Cardiff in 2022. Okay, there we are. Dan, there we had two questions in um, from people just generally on the World Cup. Yash says... Uh, since this was largely a low-scoring tournament with horrendous pitches, how much more weighting must be given to strike rate? Is 130-plus a good number for this tournament? Um, yeah, so a, a good model, for example, would actually factor in the difficulty of scoring in this in this particular tournament compared to, say, for example, T20 internationals on a general basis, you know, bilaterals or... Or, for example, ones played in the UAE or England or, or even India with, with generally favourable batting conditions. Uh, when you're looking at the amount, I'm just going through it now, uh, we're looking at about 20 batters struck at over 130 when they scored over 100 runs in the tournament. At over 150 strike rate and over 100 runs, we're looking at 10. Like, that, that's, that's really... That's really uh, elite level for this tournament right now. So yeah, we have to reframe it, the expectations. We have to const constantly do that. We've seen that. I've said that in the IPL. You know, with Impact Sub, you've got to constantly reframe expectations to to realise that the now nine economy might be okay in the IPL with with a reframe of expectations. Is that good in the big match? No, it's not. It's it's pretty poor. So so conditions change a lot. Yeah, I think as well, in, in this tournament specifically, there was such a large variety of surfaces that they 
played on that looking at tournament stats as a whole probably doesn't tell you very much because if you didn't play it if you played on that new york venue three times like south africa did you you were lucky if you were striking at 110 like that that was really good batting whereas there were some grounds where we we you know did see we, we, we were not, we weren't, there weren't there were no real like 200 pitches but there were a few 160 plus pitches that that were decent to bat on and when you mix that all in together, you get such a sort of a jambalaya of noise and, and data that you, I, I don't know if there's that much that we can infer from the, the, the whole tournament perspective. And, and that's not even factoring in that, you know, some of these batters played against Uganda and Papua New Guinea. And that's... Right. Yeah, with the greatest will in the world, they're, they're probably like, second team club standard in some of the of the major nations those those players like it's um it's great to see them there but if you are scoring 70 or 35 balls against uganda that's not telling us much about how you'll fare <laughs> against um the, the teams with a proper bowling attack um chintan asks and this is the final question for the show uh, the World Cup has been lots of fun and provided fabulous entertainment, but can it or did it tell us anything about the relative merits of the teams involved? I think it probably did. I think the best two teams made the final and the best team won the tournament. But I do accept that there's quite a lot of random stuff that happens as well. Like yeah. Pakistan losing to USA, that is a random occurrence. Even if you know we 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 know it happened and we congratulate USA for doing it. And we acknowledge that Pakistan are the kind of team that could do that again. Pakistan aren't worse than the USA. No. Um, Afghanistan aren't better than Australia on that day. They were, and they yeah. fully deserve to get through to the semi-final, but they aren't better than Australia. If we've been honest, are they? However, all of that said, I, I think India were the best team and they deserve the trophy. I don't know if you had add anything to that. No, spot on. So the two teams that got to the final won seven out of seven. In, in the group stages, across the two group stages. So um, I think ultimately you, you can't say that the any of these outcomes really was was not merited. Yeah. Cool. Dan, that's the end of the pod. Um, thanks very much for listening and watching, everyone. Do make sure you click like and subscribe. We'll be back next week. Um, actually try and schedule the, the podcast in. We <laughs> missed a couple of weeks because of... Uh, administrative inefficiency and Max's wedding got in the way as well, which was um, a pain in the ass. But yeah, here we are. We're back, and I'll uh, we'll speak well, to you again. Delighted that you refer to it as that. Uh, <laughs> pardon? I'm sure he'll be delighted that you refer to <laughs> right. it as a pain in the ass. <laughs> well, it was from a scheduling point of view. Sorry about that, Max. Uh, we'll catch everyone soon. Goodbye. <laughs>